Thank you everyone for joining us today at this momentous occasion of launching the first international chapter of Institute of Architects Bangladesh. My name is Fari Latif. I am honored to be the convener of the chapter and witness this event in history. I lead a team of Mavericks who are the members of the advisory committee. You will hear the acronym IAB a lot today. It stands for Institute of Architects Bangladesh, just so you know. <laughs> a handful of dedicated architects started the institute more than 50 years ago, and today it has grown to be over 5,300 members, and they're working not just in Bangladesh, all across the globe. The 25th Executive Council endorsed the Canada chapter July 2023, and then the same year we were federally registered as well. Our vision of this chapter is bold but simple. It is to foster collaboration, exchange ideas, and mutual learning among architects and others within our community. Not just in Canada and Bangladesh, but also our colleagues ac across the globe. We live in a very interconnected world right now. And architects' role has never been more crucial. We strive for excellence, not only in design, but also through everything else that we do. Our designs have to create inclusive, residences, buildings, so that it's accessible by everyone. It is my firm belief that the chapter will help build, help open new doors of opportunity of collaboration between architects and those who are affiliated with the architectural profession. Initiating the first ever international chapter is not an easy effort. And it takes a team of dedicated volunteers to do that. So I would like to introduce you to the advisory committee members, starting with Member Secretary Asan Ali. Please join me at the front here. <laughs> Member Akhtar Lazim Parvez. Member Aksin Ahmed Siddiqui. <laughs> Member Ali Arangozeb Jipu. <laughs> Member Kunishta Khan. There's another member who will be joining us shortly from Calgary, Abdullah Al Zubair. I would also like to invite Nubra Samain at the front. She is the facilitator of this event here. Without her initiative, this wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you to the board. And thank you to all the volunteers who relentlessly worked to make this event happen. I would also like to thank the sponsors, donors, the well-wishers all across the world who helped us. We do need more sponsors and volunteers to help us go forward. Otherwise, this uh, initiative would be in vain. We have lofty ambitions going forward to harbor an environment that can facilitate continuing education, mentorship, and um, job search for newcomers, new architects coming into Canada, those who are already established or looking to go into the job field. So thank you to our esteemed guest speakers today as well and the presenters. We are so very excited to hear what you have to share with us. This event is, of course, about building new relationships and exploring opportunities of collaboration. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And of course, the biggest thank goes to all the attendees who joined us in person, and some actually virtually who are going to be joining us as well. So thank you, everyone. There's a few housekeeping rules that I wanted to mention. 
The washrooms are out the front doors to your right. And also the fire alarm will be two stage. For the first stage, uh, which is an intermittent alarm, please stay calm, but be prepared. And if you hear the second alarm, which is a continuous tone, please uh, exit through the front door, down the stairs, outside the main doors in a uh, collective manner. Some of us uh, here are first aid um, trained, so please uh, don't feel hesitate to uh, connect with us. Also, if uh, anybody's not feeling well, there's a number of volunteers uh, at the back and around the hall, just um, let us know. So thank you very much. Um, as I said, this is our first initiative, so if there's any errors or omissions, uh, please, we ask uh, that you be kind towards that. If you can go to the next slide, please. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are living in and uh, work and function in. This is the land of the traditional, uh, this is the traditional territories of indigenous people that have cared for this land, now called Canada, since time immemorial. These lands are either subject to First Nation self-governments under modern treaty, unceded, and unsurrendered territories, or traditional territories from which First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people have been displaced. Without further ado, I would like to launch the first program of the chapter, which is the mentorship program. And I would like to invite Sadia Akhtar to walk us through the program. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you, Faria. Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to see so many talented and passionate individuals gathered here today for this inauguration program, especially the mentorship program. So we all here in Canada, when we came as a professional from our country, we faced a lot of challenges and our objective and goals are based on that. First, the foster growth, meaning uh, we will like to provide a structural environment to the newcomers where they can actually um, introduce themselves to, the, uh, to the profession. Integration and support newcomers, um, integrating into Canadian architectural practice, career advancement, help the architect to reach their goals, like CACB, PMP, whichever the path they want to go. Knowledge sharing helps the mentor and mentee so they can share their knowledge what is happening into the industry. Career guidance, Canadian architectural culture integration, where we want to introduce them what is happening into the uh, into Canadian architectural landscape. Professional networking, which is very, very important for us when you do the networking. And that's the start, the starting happens from mentorship, the mentor and mentees. IAB community building. Well, we have to make a strong bonding with our IB member because they're the family that we started from. And overall well-being, uh, provide personal and professional support a, per, a newcomer that they need. So our focus area. So we, this mentorship program, we focus five main areas, career path advance, Canadian architectural licensing, project management, building signs, settlement for new architects. That we already explained to our first slide that what is the basic of it. Because here in this presentation, we are trying to give the highlights of our mentorship program. So that's why we are keeping it very precise and we are just pointing out that what we're gonna be focusing on. Our future vision. So this mentorship program, we have a couple of phases. The first phase is gonna be the group who is living in Canada, current, currently who is living in Canada. The second phase that we want to go, the geographical boundaries will be increased, meaning the 
professionals, the architect who wants to come from Bangladesh or any other countries to Canada as an immigrant, just hear loud, we are here for you. Phase three, we, gonna in, we will introduce webinar, lecture series, SME collaboration, CDP event, etc. And the phase four is the licensing. It can be into the architectural licensing program, the exact PMP, LEED, and other examination support. We're just gonna show you what needs to be done, how you guys can do that. That is what we are trying to do. Now we're gonna what some video clips where the mentor and mentees they are gonna share their thoughts about this program. I'm Renaissance Islam, a faculty member of Architectural Technologies program at Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Calgary. Mentorship is a relationship between two people where the mentor provides advice and guidance to their mentees to help them grow, learn, and develop professionally. And at the same time, the mentors also get fresh perspective and innovative ideas from their mentees. It's a culture of continuous learning and development. One of the primary benefits that I can tell of this mentorship program is knowledge transfer and skill development. Mentees can learn a lot from mentors' extensive experiences, their successes, and even from their mistakes. It also enhances the networking opportunities to the mentees. The mentees can get industry references or connections through their mentors. Mentees will get the advice and guidance on career planning and goal setting, which will definitely help them to choose and go for a right career path. Not only that, support and encouragement from a mentor can boost a mentee's confidence. It will definitely enhance both the soft skills like communication and leadership and also the hard skills like technical and industry specific skills. So obviously this mentorship program is a very good program. Hi, this is Neha Maliat, HSA 2017 batch and I have completed my BR from SAST. As a newcomer in Canada, I expect that the mentors will guide us on CSCP accreditation procedures, job opportunities, valuable networking and overall advice to propel us forward. Hello, the mentorship program actually brings numerous benefits for both the mentor and the mentee. For the mentee, actually, it brings uh, opportunities for their career development, skill development. They can ask questions, they can ask for guidance while facing any challenges. Um, mentoring also offers opportunities for their networking, which is a very good resource. Uh, networking uh, through mentors' peer connections, uh, the mentee can build helpful networking. So on the other hand, for the men mentor, it brings opportunity to share their knowledges and expertise and also gaining fresh perspective from the mentee. They can foster their leadership skills, communication abilities while teaching and guiding others. Overall, mentoring contributes significantly to professional and career development by providing guidance, support and encouragement ultimately helping individuals navigating their career paths more effectively and achieve their goals. Hi, I'm Mona. I'm a recent graduate from SAS Architecture 2017. As a fresh graduate, I'm still looking for a job. And in a foreign country, everything is still very new to me. My expectations from my mentor would be to provide insight into the Canadian work culture, guidance with resume and portfolio, and help with CSCB procedures. I believe receiving this help from my mentor would help me with my future endeavors. Thank you. We extend our heartful gratitude to our mentor and mentees. These are the people who, who came forward to help us out and assist us. Our mentor, they are licensed architect working in various uh, provinces in Canada, academic member of Canadian universities and also colleges, project management professionals from different province, 
public and pri uh, uh, private sector employees and building specialists. Right this moment, I will hand over the presentation to Zubair, who is now in Calgary, and he will take it from there. Thank you very much, Sadia. The mentorship, mentorship collaboration will be three months long with a total of six to 10 hours time commitment from mentor and mentees. We have shared the program guidelines with the mentor and mentees and everyone on board with the terms. We have set clear expectation. Mentees will administer the schedule, prepare agendas and set meeting goals. Mentors and mentee will decide together whether to meet in person or virtually and how structured the meeting will be. Looking forward to a great mentoring experience. Uh, we are super excited to kick off our very first phase this month. It's a start of three month journey where mentors and mentees will team up until the end of August. We can't wait to see the awesome partnership that will form. In October 2024, we have got a big milestone planned. We will be sharing our survey result with everyone and talking about how we are going to make our mentorship program even better based on the feedback from mentors, mentees, and our committee members. Looking ahead, our next round of mentorship kickoff in November 2024. Right now, we are thrilled to have eight mentors and 10 mentees on board for this phase. A huge shout out to all our mentors for volunteering their time. You will amazing and truly make this program shine. In April 2025, get ready for some exciting stuff. We are bringing in a bunch of experts for lectures and collaboration. Keep an eye out for updates as we grow and improve in the years to come. Today, we are very excited to kick off our mentorship program with a vision for success. Our goal is to empower individuals and drive growth through increased employment opportunities, milestone-based professional development, positive feedback, successful networking, knowledge sharing, and community involvement. We invite you to join us on this journey to make a meaningful impact together. Thank you very much. Now I'll hand over to Sadia for the concluding remarks. Thanks to all. So here we are. We're um, five. Uh, already you guys heard Zubair from Calgary. This is me who is presenting this. And there is also Al Arangozeb Jeepu who is here and then Sabrina Rahman and also Mohuna Dash who is also a, um, a, a mentee over here as well. He's, she's standing at the back. <laughs> this program is not just an initiative but a journey towards excellence, innovation and professional growth. Remember, your success is our success. Here, if you guys have any question, please feel free to contact us. There will be an email address over here or even live chat. You guys have any question, please contact us. Due to the time constraint, as we said before, we are just giving here the highlights only of this mentor and um, men mentorship program. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Sadia. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Clinton Afonso uh, for his uh, presentation. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, give a quick bio of uh, Clinton. Clinton also leads the events and industry relations at Arido. He holds a PCD in marketing and analytics uh, from Confederation College, Thunder Bay, Ontario. With his specialty in corporate events, Clinton is uh, also a member of Meeting Professionals International. His extensive experience includes collaborations with notable organizations such as Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce, a March of uh, Dimes and Google Canada. At Arido, Clinton is instrumental in fostering connections among interior designers, students, and industry partners. A role in which uh, he takes immense pride. Raised in an entrepreneurial family, Clinton embraces his father's philosophy to put people first, a principle he upholds 
Through his exceptional interpersonal skill, in his leisure time, he enjoys exploring nature and playing the piano. Let's welcome Clinton Afonso. Good evening, everyone. And I, I promised I practiced this. Shubo Sh Shonda. I don't know if I said this right, but uh, I did a little bit of my homework. So before I start, I just want to say I couldn't spend the Saturday evening better than being here. And I'm so filled with gratitude and pride to be present here because me being an immigrant, I don't think so. I can express in words what you guys do, the Institute of Architects Bangladesh, by, by providing platforms like this and helping the immigrants and the international talents to, to get established in this, in this country. So huge, huge thank you. And I'm so proud to be invited here. And I cannot thank you enough. All right, so uh, that's me, gorgeous. <laughs> And my designation at Arido is uh, I do all the fun stuff. So event coordinator. I also do the industry relations. I also participate in events like this. Um, and I also involved with a lot of sponsorships and, and stuff. It is, it, is, it is fun. I'm always on the move, but it's also a lot of work. OK, so here I am going to speak about Arido. A-R-I-D-O. What does it stand for? It stands for Association of Registered Interior Designers of Ontario. Now, what it means, if you want to practice interior design in the province of Ontario, you have to be part of RIDO if you want to use the title interior designer. So we are a regulatory body for the title interior designer. We regulate it, we protect it, and then there's a whole process. How do you get to the title, which I will explain in the coming slides. Another milestone that we achieved this year is we are a legacy of nine decades. We were not born yesterday and the day before. We were, uh, we were established in 1934, and this March at Hayward Shoreham, Toronto, we celebrated the 90th anniversary of Arido, and we are uh, wait. We cannot wait to see what's going to happen in the next 90 years. So the total membership all over the province is about 3,000 members. And then if you want to dissect that more into just interns and registered members, we are over 1,800. So when I was talking about all the fun stuff that I do here is just a, a, a collage of all the events that we do. We do golf, we do a gutter ball, we participate in seminars, events like this, trade shows. We go to schools, our students conduct design charrettes in schools, our intern members uh, conduct uh, uh, webinars and seminars with a with lot of other affiliated associations. And then the Arido Awards Gala, I am not sure if you heard about it, but the Arido Awards Gala is the biggest and the oldest interior design awards night in Ontario. It's been there for the past 41 years, and this year it's happening on October 3rd at Rebel Toronto. Um, if anyone is interested, the tickets will be opened on, in, in August. So what is our role? As I've said, for membership, we regulate, we support, we advocate. When it comes to public, there is an awareness that we create on the scope of interior design. And then we also protect uh, in the best interest of not just our members and interior designers, but also the public. So title protection, as I've said, like you, know, you cannot use the title interior designer unless you are part of Arido, so we regulate that. Ensuring standards, education, experience, examination, your professional development, code of ethics, uh, practice standards, and disciplines for non-compliance. What happens if somebody uh, brings a complaint against a member or if, the, if our members don't follow the code of ethics or the standards? So there is a whole discipline committee that is formed, and then we take into consideration the outcome and the and the next directions. So for public awareness, we participate in public awareness campaigns like trade shows. This year and every year, we participate in the Interior Design Show Toronto. Uh, we also were part of the Toronto National Home Show. We are we are planning to be part of the Toronto National uh, of the National Home Show in Ottawa. We recently also participated in the Living Lux Design Show. So these are some of the campaigns and and uh, platforms that we take to go out there put panels together and the panels are towards the industry and also towards the public where the where we talk about why do you need to work with a qualified designer how do you work with interior design contracts what are some of the compliances that you will be entitled for 
that is also called as blog arido now if you want to see our members work then blog arido is a page for you where you will see the different projects done by our members and i would highly recommend everyone if you if you want to get a taste of uh, some of the work that our designers do and it's 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 gorgeous and the complaints process of course like as i've said if somebody you know brings a complaint how do we how do we handle that it's all it's all handled in the association so what are we working on now so we are now working on defining the scope of the work so what this means is we are building the arido oaa the ontario architect association uh, regulation model now what it means is anywhere from three stories and above you will need a qualified registered interior designer to carry the work right now it's not in place right now we have the titles act but with this new arido oaa regulation model if you want to do any interior design work anywhere from three stories and up or it could be a multi residential uh, building three stories and up you have to have to get this stamped uh, which is coming under the arido oaa regulation model so i have two career paths here and i will explain it um, uh, uh, both career paths uh, the, this is a very standard default career path where you come as a the slides are quite not clear i think it's the reflection of the light but this is a so you come here as a four year degree student and your degree has to be affiliated with cida council of interior design uh, accreditation once you educate once you get your education done a four years degree then you join arido from student to you now go to intern now in intern what we are asking is you have your experience which is categorized under either interior design experience requirement and then once you done with your experience you can give your NCIDQ exam. At the moment, we have this American-based exam, which is NCIDQ, and under that, there are three exams: IDFX, IDPX, and Practical. The good part of IDFX is you can give this exam when you are in your fourth year of your education. Now, I also want to highlight here: Arido is building its own exam, which will be implemented next year. So, beginning of next year, you will have two options: A to choose NCIDQ or if you want to practice just in Ontario then you have a Rido based uh, exam and once you've done that you are now entitled to the title interior designer so that's the default standard process that we have and these are some of the institutions colleges that we are affiliated with for your four years degree program if you are in ottawa you can go for algonquin conestoga uh, conestoga fenshaw in london ontario georgian humber sheridan ocad toronto metropolitan university and yorkville so in total we are affiliated with nine uh, institutions that has the cida proved um a uh, uh, bachelor's of interior design degree and the ida qualified work so once you're done with your four years then we ask you to get your work experience your work experience is counted only if it is under a registered interior designer or a licensed architect because we want to make sure that you were supervised by somebody who had who has met the requirements to to qualify you or to supervise your work when you are practicing now this is your alternate career path now what if you were like me who can come 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 from india or from bangladesh will arido force you or will the will the title force you to go to again four years of studies no or or maybe depends on whether you qualify or not so we have an alternate path that that arido has built it is called the icrs intern competencies review system so what it does is it saves the four years of education for you you don't have to go to college and and spend four years if you come come with foreign education or and foreign experience you have to submit us the proofs of your experience and skills you then enter icrs once we approve you once we qualify you once you once you're approved and and eligible to enter the uh, icrs you then go into 
ICRS uh, program. Uh, she's giving me a warning, okay. And then the next steps don't change. You still have to get your idea done, experience, your examination done, and then you earn the title interior designer. So the ICRS has in total 33 competencies that you have to meet, segregated into eight segments. Communication, professional business practices, coded regulations, design process, design theory, human environment, products and material, and constructions. And how this works is when you come to us saying that, you know what, I don't want to go for this education, but I can prove myself that I have these 33 competencies, we ask you to submit one proof one evidence of each competency and with that evidence you can attach to your supporting documents like in communications you can prove to us that you can interpret visuals and and narrate other uh, directions then you have to submit a evidence statement along with all your drawings or any other proof that you have and then we take it we qualify it and then we say okay you're approved or you're not which is here so you complete an online registration, you build your online book of evidence, a reader will assist you when you build that book of evidence. Uh, if you have any questions, we are there, you complete and submit your book, and then the successful stu students, you will be called saying that, hey, you know what, you're approved. Or we may say, we cannot accept this, can you get an alternative proof for us? And really quick is once you join us as intern uh, benefits that are really uh, great benefits for you, you you be part of the committee, social events and all that thing and there's still more. And as, as IAB has uh, mentioned about the mentorship program, we also run mentorship program. At the moment, we have two mentorship programs where we connect you with a mentor. And anything that you need, you want to get ready for NCIDQ, you want to get ready for this next redo based exam that we are building, all your questions, all your wish list is, is taken care of. So once you become member, that's not the end. Once you, you become member and have your title now, we also ask you to maintain your membership and that is by you have to have to go by the standards and the code of ethics. Uh, you have to complete a professional development uh, uh, education which we call CU. And just to really quick is in the period of two years, we ask you to complete 12 CUs, which is like nothing. There are a lot of CUs available there and out of those 12, eight has to be general CU and four has to be health and safety CUs. If you are uh, coming as an intern reader and if you are practicing as an interior designer, you have to have to have your liability insurance. And Arido is affiliated with um, an insurance partner, which is Prolink. So we have an exclusive discount for our members. And then of course, renew your membership. So the sec, sorry, where is this? Okay, so here, I don't know why it's showing blank. Yeah, are there any, is there anything there? Okay, so here I had email addresses. Um, if you, uh, if and, and I and I'm here all all uh, until the end of the event. So if you have any questions, I can direct you. If you want to have que if you have questions about membership or the ICRS or about events or in general, I'm here to um, to address all those questions. I just have to be mindful of the time and not take any questions at the moment. Uh, but I'm here all throughout the event. And we are here if you want to practice, uh, if, you, if, you, if you decide to go in the direction of interior design, you are more than welcome and we will be there to have your back and support you in every possible way. I don't know what, how to say in uh, thank you in Dhanabad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the presentation. Uh, and for being our guest, there's a little token of our appreciation. Uh, Clinton, if you don't mind. Photo break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And it looks like a lot of fun, <laughs> what you do. So you have to teach us how to do all those fun events. <laughs> so uh, we'll take a short break at this moment. Um, um, and then uh, we'll come back to our next presentation. Um, so just uh, stretch your legs for 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back. Thank you very much. I can request you to get back to your seats, please. We'll resume our program shortly.
Thank you, everyone. Hello. If I can request everyone to take your seats, sponsors, um, uh, footsteps. Uh, we have another presenter. Claudia was actually one of the very first uh, presenter who uh, um, agreed to accepted our invite to attend the event and do a presentation. If it's a little bit noisy at the back, please let me know. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, easier to hear everyone. If uh, if I can request everyone to take your seats, please. Thank you, and uh, during the presentation, maybe we can um, just pause the networking. There will be lots of uh, time after the event. Um, I know it's catching up with old friends and making new ones. It's very exciting, uh, but if uh, you can be just a little bit mindful about uh, listening to the presenters. So Claudia and I have been communicating <laughs> for quite some time. He's the talent acquisition specialist at Metropolitan University. He's a, talent, uh, uh, he's a seasoned talent acquisition professional who's passionate about the work that he does. He especially enjoys filling challenging roles and seeing a candidate and manager celebrate together a new beginning. Claudia has worked in the private se uh, public sector ranging from healthcare to infrastructure, to public housing, to law enforcement, to higher education. Being exposed to a variety of municipal provincial organizations, which have a vastly different focus and wide ranging impacts on the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario, has allowed Claudia to develop holistically as a talent acquisition professional by being exposed to recruiting for an eclectic mix of positions, some with very specific requirements. So please join me in welcoming Claudio and listening to his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Faria. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very grateful to be here uh, today. Um, what a lovely organization and what a lovely event. Um, really want to give a shout out to that. I know there's limited time and uh, shout out to the previous speaker, Clinton. I'll try to, I'll try to be as, as good, as entertaining as he was. Um, who, I'm, I'm going to throw it out there. Who here enjoys applying for jobs? Anyone? Show of hands. Anyone who likes applying for jobs? No, I, I, I thought so. But it's one of those things that we all have to do to secure our next job. And um, hopefully today I'll be able to talk to you a little bit about uh, the process as a whole, maybe some tips uh, for everyone to take um, when they're applying, when they're looking for a job. I'm hoping that if you do have some questions quickly as we go through the presentation, you can ask me. We'll have an opportunity at the end of the night as well to uh, network, which I think is such an important part, mentorships, networks. Um, it, it, it really, I cannot speak to the value of it, and I'm so grateful to be here tonight um, um, as part of this amazing organization. So um, I'll get on to it. Um, if you do have some questions, uh, please let me know. It is a very, um, you know, it's a very detailed subject. Everyone has an opinion. I'll give you my opinion, what I've seen in the industry. I've moved quite a bit. I've uh, witnessed different organizations. So without further ado, um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to say is I think it's very, it's very interesting. No one grows up wanting to be in HR, but people do grow up wanting to be an architect. So I think that's, that's something really cool. Also, one of, my, one of my favorite characters in Seinfeld, I don't know if you know George Costanza, he's favorite. His favorite thing to be, pretend to be, was an architect. So, um, well, let's talk about resumes, and there's lots of things you can talk about a resume, but one thing I do want to uh, convey to you, you want to make sure that your resume is easily readable. Um, a human being will actually be reading it, so um, whether it's a hiring manager, whether it's a talent acquisition person, someone's going to be reading it. Um, AI hasn't gotten to the point at which it's going to read your resume. Probably will get there in five maybe 10 years. Um, we'll see how, my, how safe my job is. But um, until that point, I'm going, I'm going to urge you to make sure that your resume is readable, that it doesn't have grammatical errors. Make sure someone reads it. You know, have a friend, a family member reading it. It's, it's so crucial. If you make a, a grammatical error, it really kind of detracts from your candidacy. Um, so those are some of the best practices. Use a Word document, use a PDF document when you're applying. Um, you know, there's different types of resumes. And I'm going to tell you here, right 
right here and right now. There's one favorite that talent acquisition people love in its chronological resumes. Um, people think that if you use a functional resume, sometimes you may have uh, gaps in your experience, and that's okay that you have gaps. We all have things that happen in our lives. Use a chronological resumes. resume. Typically in the public sector, we want to see how many years of experience you have. That's the preferred resume. Uh, basically, the chronological resume, as the name implies, is a resume where you go, you know, in terms of most recent to, um, you know, other positions you've had. You talk about the positions that you've had, etc. Um, so, indeed, use a chronological resume. Do not worry about the other resumes. They're not as good. The, the overall talent acquisition industry loves a chronological resume. Um, tips for a successful resume. Tailor your resume to the job requirement. I know it sounds simple, but that's literally what it is. You want to make sure that your application really reflects the job posting or the requirements of the role. I know it sounds simple, but it's, it's, it, you know, uh, it's harder to do, but it, it is that simple. Look at the keywords that are used in a job description. Make sure their resume is using those keywords. Make sure that the software, whether it be AutoCAD, BIM, Revit, et cetera, is being used. Um, any quick questions about resumes? before we go on? No? How long should they be? Very good question. See, there's always a good question. Um, I say typically two pages. If you're going to three pages and you've got lots of experience, that's perfectly fine. I would say even four pages if you're uh, 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 an executive and you've got a ton of experience. Now, the thing is, if it's relevant, keep it. If it's not, then don't keep it, right? Um, you might even want to group your experience in, in two categories, relevant experience versus other experience at times. It really depends on the position that you're applying for. But generally two to three pages. I've had folks that um, thought that you should keep it to you know, only one page and they've left out important information. So I'm going to tell you two to three pages. If you go over, over two pages, you're going to be fine, I promise you. No one's going to throw your resume or candidacy away. Now, four pages, I'll be like, oh, I don't know, you know? but. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about that. Any other questions before we move on to my favorite part of the application process? No? Cover letters. Cover letters are the worst, um, but you need them. You need to have a cover letter. Um, and I spend the least amount of time uh, on my cover letter personally. Um, your resume is what, your talent what the talent acquisition professionals look at first. And I'll make a confession that I make to everyone. I don't read cover letters. I know that sounds really badly, and there are probably hiring managers in the room for you, you hire, all right? Lisa, you probably hire. You might read the cover letters. You might want to take a, uh, see how the communication skills of the candidates are. So you might take a gander at it. I don't read them. So make sure that they're grammatically correct. Uh, I typically have one paragraph that I customize for my cover letters, uh, but the rest is pretty much boilerplate because I'm going to be applying for talent acquisition roles. So if you're going to be applying generally for the same type of roles within architecture, project management, uh, interior design, etc., then you might just want to leave one, um, one paragraph that you talk about your interest in the organization, how you align with their values, why you want to work there. The rest is probably going to be the same, so I would leave it the same. But just make sure that there are no grammatical errors. It really irks uh, managers when they're going through an application and there's grammatical errors or it's not properly formatted or it's hard to read or there's three pages. So definitely, definitely not a three-page cover letter. One page. If it's more than one page, then, then it's not good. Uh, we're not, we're going to continue reading your application, I promise, but, um, I mean, cover letters I don't read, but nonetheless, you need a cover letter. You still need a cover letter. Which one's more important? I think I touched based on that. Um, Chat GPT. Is, is anyone here using Chat GPT at the moment? Yes. Awesome people. Fantastic people. I highly urge you to use tools. Um, Chat GPT can really give you a great cover letter. Uh, draft. Make sure you read it. Make sure you don't just copy and paste it and then send it across. Make sure you actually read it. And in the prompts, it could be very specific. I want you to give me a cover letter for a uh, interior for a space planning assistant at Toronto Metropolitan University uh, or a university in downtown Toronto. And it will give you a really good first draft that you can start from. So AI is here to stay. It's a tool. Make sure you use it, especially for 
uh, your job preparation, you know, for when it comes to research, when it comes to other things, there are some implications that you might want to consider. But there's no plagiarism when it comes to cover letters or resumes, so use it. Why not? There are a ton of resume templates out there online, so um, make sure you use those as well. Um, I'm going to move ahead. Uh, applicant tracking systems. Who here is afraid of an applicant tracking system? No one? All right. Axon, perfect. Thanks for, for saying that. You know, it's one of those um, kind of black boxes that everyone's like, oh, I don't know what happens. The applicant tracking system, it's going to block my application. It's not going to get me through. I need to, to, to make sure that I cheat the ATS, make sure that a human is actually reading it. Well, I'll let you know, especially in the public sector, we're really, really behind technological advances because of the lack of money. But I'm not here to talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm just here to let you know that a human always reviews your application, at least in the public sector. Even in the private sector, my counterparts um, who are working at Meta or other organizations, they're actually reviewing them themselves. So whether we get 300, 400 applications, we actually go through them one by one. Now I'm going to shock you all. I'm going to ask uh, you um, a quick question. How long do you think a talent acquisition professional spends with a resume? 10 seconds. That's actually pretty good. That actually, that's actually how, how much I spend. So, so 10 seconds. Who said that? That's impressive. Are you a talent acquisition professional? You're a genius, sir. Um, but yes, 8 to 10 seconds. So that's very little. So make your resume readable. Make sure that your skills, your, um, the important requirements of the job, the keywords of the job, the software that, that is required is on there. Um, do not spend money on people who are promoting services such as Beat the ATS. Um, they're not helpful. So what they'll actually tell you is to use a ton of words that are the keywords in the job, which you can do yourself, which is the best practice anyway. That's literally what they'll tell you. Um, ATSs are searchable. We sometimes use um, ATS stands for Applicant Tracking System, in case I didn't actually say that. Um, but basically, there, it's a database. It's a database where we keep our resumes. And when I first started, there used to be email inboxes for each job. And I, would, I remember my first job was to sort these resumes in this huge inbox. They would come in and we'd have like, I don't know, 30 to 40 jobs. And I'd have to pick each every resume and drop it in the appropriate uh, folder within that big mailbox. So it's a database. It's an improvement. You actually use it to keep track of resumes. You sometimes are able to search it. So that's why it's important to have your softwares uh, or anything that you bring, any experience uh, in your resume so that whenever it's searched, it actually comes up. Or whenever a hiring manager looks at it, you, they can actually see what uh, experience you have. Um, so don't spend money on snake oil, is what I'm saying. Uh, use of chat GPT in your preparation, highly recommend you use this tool. Um, I sometimes use it for interview questions. Question? No? Oh, five minutes. <laughs> I was like, that's an intricate way to, to, to get my attention. I was like, no problem, no problem. Um, all right, so make sure that you use this tool. Like I said, I was just confessing, Lisa, please don't tell my boss that I use ChatGPT. No, I'm kidding. She knows. Um, so I sometimes use ChatGPT to ask it for some interview questions. Uh, I do have a huge edit of database, but sometimes I'm just curious. What will it spit, spit out? I don't just copy and paste it. Um, you can use it yourself to kind of ask it, what kind of interview questions might I get? Uh, at an interview for a space planning assistant, which by the way is a real vacancy that we're working on at Toronto Metropolitan <laughs> University. So what kind of questions would I get at a, at a university in downtown Toronto for a particular position? And it will spit out some really interesting questions. It will help you prepare um, for, for those interviews. Um, okay, so make sure you review it. I cannot stress it enough. Make sure you review it. Um, all right, LinkedIn and networking. So we're here networking. This is fantastic. This is amazing. This is, this is something I wish I, I, I would have done even better in my career. And it's something that I think IAB is doing an amazing job of, the mentorships, the connecting of people, the sharing of knowledge. Um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, whether you, you know, I, I would argue it's, it's false that 80% of the job market uh, is hidden. That's, that's not true. But by networking and making connections, you get to be the first to know about the jobs that are posted in various places. Um, you'll get to build a connection. Um, when, once people know you, it's easier to, to forge a relationship, to, to 
present yourself at the interview. Um, so continue networking, continue attending events, continue uh, making connections with mentors in various organizations so that you understand what those organizations are doing. Informational interviews, LinkedIn. I, I do want to talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my favorite thing ever. Um, it's the only social media I'm active on. It's, I think, the only social media that matters. I'm kidding. No, it's not. But connect with me, please. I do have a QR code that you can scan and connect with me. Um, it's really important that we connect. For me too, actually, because I might be hiring you at one point in time. Um, so it's important to connect on LinkedIn. Another way to put your foot in the, do in the door is to ask for informational interviews. And just keep in mind, these are not uh, opportunities for you to ask for a job, but for you to gain knowledge and an understanding of the organization you're interested in, um, their practices, what they're working on, and then maybe do an elevator pitch. That's okay. You can just kind of just like put that in at the end, right? Um, but just keep in mind, there are cer certain subtleties to networking. There are certain subtleties to approaching people on LinkedIn. I always hate those people that always reach out to you and are like, hi. And you're like, hi? <laughs> and you know they're going to be selling you something. So um, interviewing, what can you expect? Well, it's nerve wracking, that's for sure. So what you, one thing you can do is be prepared. Panel interviews, they're the common uh, bread and butter in Canada. Um, typically in public sector, that's all you're probably going to be doing. Phone screens are typically the first step. It's typically one-on-one -on -one with a talent acquisition person. Um, but basically for interviewing, in order to ease the interviewing um, stress and pressure, you might want to be preparing yourself ahead of time with some examples. Some, there's some common questions that you can prepare yourself for. Um, use ChatGPT to kind of think about what are some of the other questions. Look at the job description, job posting, kind of anticipate some of the questions. Record yourself on video, see how you look, see how, whether those examples that you're picking are actually making sense. There's different types of interviews. Behavior-based is something that we use. Behavior-based basically means we're asking you to give an example from your experience. It's a fancy name. Um, that just means we want you to give an example from your experience. So make sure that you pick a great example. That's why I want, I want to talk to you about an accomplishment journal, a career journal. Um, it's fantastic. You, you, write, um, you write in it all of your accomplishments at work, all of the cool projects you've done, and it helps to pump you up uh, when you're feeling down about, oh, I've achieved that. I can, I can definitely move on. But not only that, it helps you prepare for those interviews because once you have a successful example of a project or Anything that you've done, um, there's some sort of collaboration, there's some sort of conflict that happens, there's some sort of everything that you can imagine hap gets poured into a successful project. So um, that's one way to prepare. There are some uh, technical questions, there are some situational questions. Uh, I really don't, I'd love to go into, uh, it sounds like my alarm's up. Um, <laughs> So accomplishment journal, and, and it does help with performance management, right? Performance management season, we all have to remember what we've done throughout the year and then actually, you know, give it to our boss, but we've been doing a great job, so, you know, it's going to be very easy to go back to that particular tool. And I promise I'm almost done. Um, portfolio or not, um, I tried to make it funny, but it, it's not that funny, the, the title of it. Um, but basically, for some jobs, a portfolio is required. If you're an architect, you probably have a portfolio, but sometimes it's not required. So just kind of see what the requirements of the job are. Um, typically will be written, whether candidates or the talent acquisition professional will ask you to prepare a portfolio. It really depends on the job that you're applying for. So one thing I do want to let you know, kind of leave you with, is you should do your research. You should figure out what kind of job would I, what kind of jobs would I like to apply for? What kind of organizations would I like to apply for? Do your research, find the job postings for those organizations, look at the requirements, uh, look at what they're asking, are they asking for portfolios or not? Should you prefer prepare portfolios or not? Once you do your research, you can kind of have an idea. Um, how is it used? Well, it's used to kind of see the work that you've done in the past. It's a quick way to assess the work that you've done in the past. And I don't think we have time for questions. All right. No. no. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I look forward to chatting with each and every one of you. Thank you very much, Claudio. And again, thank you. Uh, you were one of the very first uh, presenters. Yeah. And uh, just a little token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Claudio. It uh, reminds me a couple of years back when uh, I was preparing my re uh, resume and job application. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, looking at it again, and maybe I'll send some something to you soon. I look for the openings for uh, <laughs> MTU. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so our next guest is uh, Sherbel Moreno, uh, originally from Toluca, Mexico. Sherbel worked for different private universities recruiting students. Sherbel has worked uh, in the international education sector promoting Canada as a top study destination for several years. His uh, experience includes working for Language Canada, Seneca College, and English language program at University of Toronto. He currently works for the Office of the Vice President International at E of T as a lead of the America's region fa uh, facilitating initiatives and activities that contributes to E of T's international strategic plan. Let us uh, welcome Sharbel. Thank you so much. Actually, I, I just realized that that is not updated, so apologies. <laughs> I currently work for the School of Continuing Studies at U of T. That was my previous role at, um, at U of T. Um, okay, so let's start uh, with the presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation to be in this amazing initiative. I feel privileged to um, present you the School of Continuing Studies at U of T. And so, very quickly, um, just to show you how uh, SCS has evolved since the university started um, in 1869, actually, but this is when the first open enrollment courses started. Um, and then um, the School of Continuing Studies was kind of the first or one of the first uh, schools who started an English language learning. And then, um, you know, the evolution has come up to different uh, important milestones. Uh, in 2018, I want to stop here a little bit because that's when um, we started developing customized programming for specific needs in the market, such as, uh, you know, companies and government agencies and uh, you know other organizations so my portfolio particularly is to try to marry the needs from government agencies uh, so you know public sector will be my my portfolio non-for-profit organizations and special projects as well so trying to marry in their training needs or professional needs with the uh, programming that we offer at the School of Continuing Studies. So, speaking a little bit more about what we offer at the School of Continuing Studies, uh, we always work with instructors or subject matter experts and an internal team of learning, in, in learning innovation who helps us in designing this programming. So, we are uh, very future focused and fresh. Uh, again, we are the non-credit, uh, non-degree academic unit at U of T. Uh, we offer op multiple plan line of, lines of business, such as the open enrollment programs. And what does that mean is that everyone can join our program. Um, you don't need to have a degree, basically. You can even live abroad, uh, you know, in another country, and then just, you know, enroll in one of our programs. Uh, so that's the beauty of the open enrollment, um, um, you know, offering. Again, uh, we offer English language uh, training at the School of Continuing Studies, which I also had the privilege to represent a few years ago. This is also very interesting. Uh, most people don't know that we actually have a comparative education services unit. So what that means is that you can take your credentials to our department here and they will help you in have a comparative uh, process. Uh, you know, with the Canadian um, framework, you know. So um, this is something that we can offer, and a lot of people are, you know, s surprised when they learn about this this particular service that we offer. Um, as I mentioned, we offer customized programming for, you know, companies or uh, government agencies. We also offer blueprint career services, and what this means is that we uh, we can help at your resume, we can help also with, um, you know, providing some webinars. We often 
um, offer webinars and talks with experts in the market uh, that, that are available to the public and are, you know, about trend, trendy topics, uh, you know, for search, uh, several sectors in, in the market as well. I encourage you to look at our, our website at the School of Continuing Studies and, and uh, register for our uh, Blueprint Career Services in, in where you can find these webinars available to you. We also offer post-secondary education preparedness. Um, we are about to launch um, a personal finance course for equity deserving communities. Uh, this is coming up. That, that is part of the post-secondary education preparedness. Um, and yeah, uh, we focus on entrepreneurial, fast-paced, responsive culture. And again, we, we try to, you know, marry the te theory and practice uh, from with, with our subject matter experts and, um, and our team. A little bit about, uh, you know, the list of we, the things that we offer as well. You know, we have eight, more than 800 courses available as a programming part of the continuing studies. Uh, as I mentioned, we have some of the career transition courses. We offer over more than 100 certificates English language program. Again, most of the courses, most of the programming are uh, nowadays offered online. Very few in class, which still we have some, but after, you know, after the pandemic, everything kind of moved into the digital world, which I think is it's, uh, more convenient. Uh, and, you know, open the door to people out there, uh, to other, you know, other countries to, um, to have the, the possibility to enroll to this, this uh, amazing programming. We have the education assessments, as I mentioned. We currently offer also boot camps in trendy topics such, such as cybersecurity, cyber security, data science, uh, fintech, and so on and so forth. And I don't know if anyone here has uh, heard about the micro courses or micro credentials. Anyone here has, yeah? Okay, so very few people. So. The micro credentials, what they offer is. Can you take it off and then I'll put, I'll put it on. Roger that. I'm riding your bicycle. No! Sorry about that. No worries. I'll just pause for a minute. This is a funny moment of this presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any jokes like my colleagues here. Okay. Oh, micro credentials. So it's uh, nowadays, this is very trendy right now. What we do is, what, what is a micro-credential? It's basically a shorter course that you can take and they will give you the skills that you need uh, hands-on in, in certain topics such as the ones that you see here, business analysis, finance, communications, information technology, marketing, and so on and so forth. This is very trendy right now in on Vogue and a lot of companies right now are looking at uh, people who have these micro-credentials and the beauty of these courses is that as you can take them in a very short period of time. I'm talking about six to eight weeks, sometimes 12 weeks. And then you have this micro-credential and you can put that as a part of your resume and uh, on your LinkedIn. And, um, you know, basically you are accredited or you are considered sort of like a, a, an expert in this kind of uh, um, areas. So what is a micro-credential? This is actually a working definition by the high quality, um, high, higher education quality uh, council in Ontario. A micro-credential is a representation of learning awarded for participation in a short program that is focused on a small set job relevant competencies. So it's basically skills training. Um, and we offer more than 48 micro-credentials. Um, so again, I encourage you to explore our website and learn more about this. These micro-credentials also, again, as I mentioned, these are based in industry laddering and, uh, you know, like examples in the industry right now. And also the great, uh, you know, good news about these micro-credentials and basically all our offering right now can, you can have financial aid, aid to, um, to have access to this through these uh, different, uh, you know, awards and um, 
um, processes. Um, so again, I encourage you to look at the uh, the website. You can have more information and um, have access to these these benefits to to start studying. Very important and interesting information that I have for you today is what is that? What are those potential programs of interest? for the um, IAB members here. So this is the current offer that we have at the School of Continuing Studies that might be interesting to you. So we have fundamentals of running an architectural practice, which uh, you know, is accredited for the, um, you know, the Association um, of Architects in Ontario. And this course, uh, it's 31 hours eligible for a maximum of 31 CE credit hours with the OAA. We also offer the Ontario Association of Architects admission course. Okay, so also very important to note. Um, other courses that could be interesting to you, Foundations of Enterprise Architecture, Archi Enterprise Architecture uh, Development and Governance, tools and applications in enterprise architecture and foundations of project management. So these three courses here are recognized by the Project Management Institute, which means that um, you know you usually, if you want to get a certification to get your PMP, uh, you should have at least uh, 35 hours of preparation. So these courses can offer that preparation for your exam at the PMP. What is the relationship that we have uh, with the Ontario Architects Association? Well, basically, they work uh, closely with us. Uh, our instructors have a very strong understanding on how the OAA operates and certify its applicants. So when you take a course, one of the courses that I mentioned, um, be assured, you can rest assured that the instructors will uh, you know, share their experience with, with the learners regarding to, to this um, accreditation. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Just a small uh, token of our appreciation and a moment for the event. Pleasure to announce the next presenter at our event. Dr. Lisa Landrum. I don't know how you do it, Lisa, as I mentioned before, holding two really important positions. Lisa is the chair of the Department of Architectural Sciences at the Metropolitan, uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. And she's also the current president of Canadian Architectural Certification Board. Lisa is an architect, educator, and scholar dedicated to strengthening bonds between academia and practice while advancing social justice, cultural meaning, and architectural imagination. She is a professor of architecture and chair of the Department of Architecture Science at TMU, and is the current president, as I mentioned, of CACB. She holds a professional Bachelor of Architecture from Carleton University and a post-professional Master's and PhD in Architectural History and Theory from McGill University. She is a licensed architect in Ontario, Manitoba, and state of New York. <laughs> Her research on architectural agency and intersections of architecture, theater, philosophy, and democracy is widely published, including the recent book, Theaters of Architectural Imagination. So please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening, and I can uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor, and I have already learned so much uh, from your hospitality, from your framing of the event, and from the generous speakers who have already addressed us. Um, and thank you in particular, Farira and Numbris, for making the connection and reaching out to me. And maybe one of the things, so I have no slides, and I don't think I have any jokes, but <laughs> I will say that I do read cover letters. <laughs> I, I think they, they, they tell me something about the, um, the human being who is on the other side of the application, and I think that's very important to the connectivity of uh, society and of our, our profession. So congratulations to you all on forming this Canadian chapter of the Institute of Architects, Bangladesh. 
It's an important time to be forming architectures of global solidarity and mutual support towards positive transformation across Canada and around the world. As an architect myself who studied in Canada and then worked for some years in the United States, specifically New York City, I myself have, have experienced uh, some cross-border challenges. But the difficulties and bias I experienced 30 years ago as a young woman with a professional degree, having to prove my credentials to immigration officers. I still <laughs> think about this. <laughs> But this is, I suspect, small compared to the challenges that some of you have had to overcome to be here today. So as a longtime educator and a new chair of one of Canada's 12 architecture schools, I have had the real joy of learning alongside students from all around the world. Students who have really enlarged my world including student leaders who have worked to build their own organizations for mutual support and as a way of amplifying student voices, desires and concerns. And I'm actually thrilled to see a couple of TMU architecture students here this evening and really pleased to know that this organization is a transgenerational transgener one uh, formed with the next generation of professionals and um, seasoned designers. So each year it is more clear how and why we all need an architecture of inclusion that not only tolerates but respects and celebrates diversity. The composition of the student body in architecture schools is the most diverse today that it's ever been, ever. <laughs> but there's more work to do. We need more diversity in faculty members, uh, especially in architecture programs. Uh, more diversity in program leadership and more diversity of our curriculums. As an educator and academic leader, uh, I also know that we need an architecture of mobility and knowledge exchange. Canadian architects have so much to learn from other regions and especially from you. While Bangladesh has more than four times the population of Canada and in a fraction of the land area, we share many things, including concerns for quality architecture and for designing amid fragile ecologies, precarious biodiversity, and rising sea levels. We need an architecture of, of care for things we hold in common, for all that needs our protection and all that nourishes us including the global indigenous knowledges that can help us recover a more respectful and reciprocal relationship with the land and liquid landscapes. As president of the Canadian Architectural Certification Board, this is an organization responsible for degree certification uh, for everyone on the path to licensure in Canada. I also know that we need a better architecture of openness, an architecture of respect, an architecture of proper empowerment and dignity. There are as many new architectural interns entering the profession each year in Ontario from elsewhere as from the five Ontario University architecture programs. We need better architectures of support and mutual exchange to make processes effective and empowering. We need to learn from the work of architects like Maria Tabasum, who spoke to us briefly there on the screen, uh, one of the most significant Bangladesh architects. We need to learn from her and all of you how to craft a better world by bringing together material and social sensibilities, gradually weaving together better, better buildings and a better society. Um, maybe a bit like Marina, and I've always felt that everyone is an architect in a way. <laughs> I know the regulators might not agree with that point on, on a finer detail, but you know, emotionally at the heart of it, everyone is an architect. Everyone has a sense of what place makes them feel good, <laughs> what place doesn't, how a place can, can help give you more dignity. Um, everyone is an architect. So congratulations on this architecture of um, solidarity and mentorship that you have created in cross-cultural exchange uh, because the world needs you, <laughs> needs your organization, and needs the work that all architects do now more than ever to build an architecture of compassion and humility, an architecture of curiosity and beauty, and above all, an architecture of peace. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Thank you so much, Lisa.
So Lisa just mentioned she would like to visit Bangladesh someday. <laughs> we are so, so um, thankful. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was uh, amazing. So I'll pass it on to Asan to introduce our next guest. Thank you, Faria. Thank you, Lisa. Our uh, next speaker is Drew Hauser. Uh, Regional Director, uh, Ontario Southwest. Yeah, apologies. I think our next guest is running a little bit behind the uh, schedule. In the meantime, what we will do is um, during the break, we um, conveyed the message of our Institute's president, Dr. Khandakar uh, Shabir, uh, previously. But uh, let's take a moment to listen to his uh, message. And as Lisa earlier mentioned, uh, architect Marina also sent us uh, her well wishes. So let's uh, take a moment while we wait for Drew to arrive, uh, listen to their messages for the chapter. Thank you. Gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow architects, and friends, good afternoon. And I welcome you all to this momentous event of the Institute of Architects Bangladesh Canada chapter. Uh, the Institute of Architects Bangladesh is established 50 years ago and has been in the forefront of shaping architectural landscape of Bangladesh, nurturing talent, setting benchmarks and professional standards. Today, as we extend our reach to Canada, we celebrate not just an expansion, but a deepening of our commitment for fostering global collaboration, exchange of ideas and mutual growth. Canada chapter will bring to the fore architectural heritage of Bangladesh while celebrating the culture and architecture through discourse of Canada. The chapter will serve as a bridge between our two nations, promoting exchange of knowledge, expertise, and cultural insights. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who have made an, this momentous occasion possible by providing time and effort uh, in organizing this event. Uh, members, dedicated volunteers, and chapter leadership. Thank you very much for, for this effort. I commend you for this effort. In conclusion, I'm filled with immense pride and optimism for the journey ahead. Thank you. Welcome Canada Chapter, Institute of Architects, Bangladesh. Institute of Architects, Canada Chapter, Shadoshudar Ki Amar, অনেক অনেক শুভেচ্ছা এবং সালাম আমি নেদারল্যান্ড থেকে মেসেজটা পাঠাচ্ছি ইউএফটিতে পড়িয়েছি টোরন্টোতে আসার সুযোগ হয়েছে অনেকের সাথেই দেখা হয়েছে সেজন্য আমার কাছে খুবই ভালো লাগছে যে এরকম একটা আয়োজন হচ্ছে আসলে আর্কিটেকচার কালচারে আমাদের অনেকেরই অনেক কিছু কন্ট্রিবিউট করার আছে স্পেশালি আমরা যারা বাংলাদেশে পড়াশোনা করেছি এবং এখন দেশের বিভিন্ন জায়গায় ছড়িয়ে যাচ্ছি আমাদের অনেক কিছু করণীয় আছে দেশের জন্য দেশের মানুষের জন্য দেশের আর্কিটেকচার কালচারকে আরো উত্তর উত্তর এগিয়ে নেওয়ার জন্য সেজন্য আমি মনে করি যে আমাদের এই প্রয়াস এই ইনস্টিটিউটের একটা চ্যাপ্টার যেটা ক্যানাডাতে তৈরি হয়েছে এখান থেকে আমরা অনেক কিছু পাবো অনেক লাভবান হব দেশের মানুষ লাভবান হবে এবং আমাদের আর্কিটেকচার কালচারের আরো উন্নতি হবে সেজন্য সবাইকে অনেক অনেক শুভেচ্ছা হোপফুলি সুন্দর একটা প্রোগ্রাম হবে আমি মিস করছি বাট উইশিং ইউ অল দ্য ভেরি বেস্ট থ্যাংক ইউ So thank you so much. That was the formal part of our, of our event. We'll wait for uh, Drew to show up. Maybe it's the traffic, Toronto traffic, we, <laughs> the famous uh, traffic. Maybe he stopped there. I'm just uh, checking his messages. Um, and uh, so our last guest for tonight, um, before our another guest uh, is coming, who's the guest of honor. but. I'm so very honored to introduce Dr. Ulrike. And we connected fairly recently, and I'm so pleased that you were able to um, come to our event tonight. 
Dr. Ulrike is the director and CEO of the Aga Khan Museum, the beautiful building that we are all uh, very familiar with. She is recognized as a leader in the field of Islamic art and museology. Dr. Ulrike al Kamis holds a PhD in Islamic art from the University of Edinburgh and has served as co-director at the Sharjah Museum of Islamic Civilization, as well as the senior strategic advisor to the Sharjah Museum department in the UAE. She began her career in Scotland where she worked as the principal curator for South Asia and the Middle East in the National Museums of Scotland and curator for Muslim art and culture at Glasgow Institute. So gives me great honor to invite Dr. Ulrich to share a few words with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very honored to be here tonight, um, even if I am probably a complete cuckoo in the nest, given the fact that um, I'm a museum person, I'm an Islamic art historian, and know very, very little about architecture. But at the same time, I work with great passion and love in an architectural masterpiece. Um, if you have been up to the Winford site, Winford Drive site up in North York, you will be aware of the spectacular architectural fireworks and indeed design fireworks that are happening on the site, which was established in 2014 um, at the behest of His Highness the Aga Khan, who as you know is the spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslim community and the site which is a seven hectare site includes the Ismaili Center Toronto which is the community center and the prayer hall of the Ismaili Muslims but was designed by an Indian Christian architect called Charles Korea. The Aga Khan Park which uh, is inspired by gardens all across the Muslim world and incorporates indigenous Canadian flora and Fauna was designed by a Serbian-Lebanese landscape architect called Vladimir Jorovic. And then, of course, our museum, um, the Khan Museum, with, at its heart, the Islamic art collection of about 1,200 pieces from the 7th to the now 21st century, was designed in close consultation between His Highness and the Pritzker Prize winning Japanese architect Fumihiko Maki. So, when you look at this site, you already see a little bit about our mission and mandate. As the very first museum in North America exclusively dedicated to the arts of the Muslim world, our ultimate goal is actually pluralism fostering pluralism through the arts and through intercultural encounter. Our mission is to spark wonder, curiosity, and understanding of Muslim cultures in their interconnectedness with other culture. But our overarching vision in this is not an artistic one, it is a social development one. It is to positively impact lives and to contribute to inclusive, peaceful communities and societies. So in our museum, I said, we have an Islamic art collection, but we also have a lot of temporary exhibitions in which we address themes that are of universal pluralistic interest. We have performing arts uh, initiatives, like living arts initiatives, because for us, of course, the arts are not looked at in a Western-centric way, but are really looked at in um, in a way of Tawheed, if you like, because obviously in non-Western cultures, the visual arts, the intangible arts were never separate. They were always part of the same search for the divine and expression of the divine. We also have a very rich education program uh, with students, with schools, with colleges, with universities. So we are really trying to drive our mandate and our mission through very many different um, agencies. And of course, 
you just saw uh, Marina Tabassum. We were very much honored uh, that she came to us for a talk in 2019. And of course, she is also one of the award winners of the Khan Award for Architecture. And she came in the deepest January. The snow was up to our knees. And we were apologizing to her and were saying, we were so sorry that you know you had to come to Canada and to Toronto to during this horrendous weather. And she said, you know, my work in Bangladesh, I have to work around our nature, our climate all the time. We have a lot of rain, a lot of water. And she said, I always think about that the rain has a right to be there. So she said, you should relax and recognize that your snow has a right to be there. And every winter since then, I remember her. And I'm telling you this story because you, having come to Canada to find your feet, to find your careers, it is not only a matter of you trying to fit into a new alien Western system and make your mark in a system that um, is set in its ways. But it is also about being confident, about bringing your wisdom, your knowledge, and your different perspectives on your craft to Canada, because you are an enrichment in bringing those perspectives to Canada. So be confident in what you have to bring and speak up for what you have to bring. Of course, I'm also standing here tonight as, in a sense, a representative of our mothership, which is the Aga Khan Development Network, and on our side of the house, the cultural side, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And under the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, we have the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which, of course, seeks awardees every three years for spectacular architectural initiatives that are um, presented in lands with majority Muslim communities or driven by Muslim architects. And again, our relationship with Bangladesh on that, lim uh, on that level has been very, very fruitful. We have had several awardees um, uh, under that uh, award. So I hope we can consolidate our friendship. Please come and visit us and uh, keep us in mind if there are any opportunities to collaborate. We are absolutely there for you as a home from home. I wish you the very, very best, Bitaufiq, and you are making a difference to this country, so thank you for that. We are over enthusiastic with our videos, but <laughs> thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, so this is just a token of our appreciation. Thank you. And as uh, Dr. Ulrike had mentioned, several of Bangladeshi architects in the past had won uh, the Aga Khan Award, and the latest b uh, by architect Marina Tabassum, who has taken the uh, architectural um, exposure of Bangladeshi architects to a whole different level. So right now I see that our guest of honor is here, our Consul General, Mohammad Farouk Hussain. So please, uh, if you don't mind, sir, join me at the front. <laughs> you can come, I'll, I'll do some introduction. <laughs> I'll do a short introduction and pass the mic to you. So, um, Mohammed Farouk Hussain, he's the Consul General of Bang uh, Bangladesh in Canada. He's a career diplomat and currently heads the Consulate of the People's Republic of Bangladesh in Toronto, Canada. He joined the Consulate in fairly recently, end of February 2024, as the thir third Consul General of Bangladesh since the establishment of the Consulate in Toronto in 2018. So thank you, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Farouk. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this is my only address, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me uh, begin by thanking the convener 
of IAB Bangladesh chapter Canada, right? Um, <clears throat> for inviting me uh, to this uh, inaugural ceremony uh, of this platform. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure for me because um, architects are uh, some of the most talented uh, creative and ingenious minds uh, in all society, all country, except the world. And I feel honored to join this gathering. Um, you know, uh, the world is a networked world. Uh, networking uh, is, uh, is a power. Networking is very rewarding. Creating uh, platforms like this indeed uh, facilitates uh, networking, um, um, which can allow um, aspiring uh, architects from Bangladesh to come over to Canada to uh, work, to settle here. So hats up to uh, all these initiatives taken by, uh, I think, uh, you and others, uh, all the organizers uh, for, uh, for this initiative, which I believe would really create this opportunity uh, for people from Bangladesh, uh, creative people from Bangladesh to come and work here. Now, uh, as uh, the convener mentioned, uh, I am not an architect. I'm a, I'm a diplomat by profession and training. So I would be very brief, actually, because if I otherwise, I would, be, I would run the risk of sounding irrelevant and uh, monotonous. Uh, let me, allow me uh, to make a few points, very briefly also. Uh, first, uh, this, um, uh, very frankly, actually, as Consul General, uh, I am invited to attend many programs almost daily. Uh, today, I had a program in the morning, uh, the Bangla uh, Boimala. I inaugurated that as well. Uh, but the issue, the unfortunately, every uh, program that I attend, I see division uh, in our community. That's a big challenge. Uh, every organization, every com uh, community platform um, has a counter platform. Uh, be it economical organization, be it social organization, be it uh, cultural platform, whatever it is. Say, uh, for example, uh, in Canada, we have a Dhaka University Alumni Association. You would be surprised to know that a number of alumni associations are there. Um, so goes for uh, trade. We have two chambers that uh, represent business communities, Bangladeshi business community in Canada. Udisi, for example. Very um, innocuous, uh, harmless organization in Bangladesh. We have a number of branches uh, here, number of um, counter entities. So you name it, actually. So I believe that um, IAB uh, Canada's chapter would be a bit different um, in promoting uh, unity. Um, uh, unity is a strength. Uh, you can pursue your objective unitedly. That's my first point. The second point is, uh, this, uh, the need for creating value for the pl platform that you created today. Uh, because otherwise, uh, there is no meaning, right? Um, value creation, how can you create value? Um, they, of course, you have potentials. Um, people from Bangladesh want to come to Canada. Now, you need to guide them. You need to uh, share knowledge technology. Uh, in Bangladesh, perhaps you know better than me, uh, we have lack of proper investment in R&D. So you can be a platform that can promote R&D. You can help Bangladeshi um, architects to overcome the challenge, initial challenge of uh, finding works here, um, all the challenges that they face to settle here, all these things. That way you can be meaningful, you can create value for your platform. Um, what else? My third point is, um, everywhere I go, I mention this. Uh, although we are living abroad, we have a responsibility towards Bangladesh, right? Um, we need to contribute to the development of Bangladesh. We need to promote the image of Bangladesh. That's our responsibility. And of course, there are many ways how you can do that. Bangladesh, you can invest in Bangladesh. You can promote investment. As architects, you can invest, you can encourage investment in architectural projects in Bangladesh. Everywhere in the world, you know, there is need for 
eco-friendly, sustainable infrastructure. And Bangladesh is no different. You can, of course, go and invest yourself, or you can encourage your friends to go there. And how you can, you can promote the image of Bangladesh? That's again, there are many ways, of course. Um, but I believe, as a person, if you work hard, if you, um, if you become a true citizen, true, true Canadian, good employee or employer, that way you can, uh, first of all, enhance your image. And when you enhance your image, automatically the image of Bangladesh would be brightened. And then the demand for Bangladeshi workers uh, would go up. More and more people from Bangladesh can come. So, of course, uh, that's up to you, but that's my request. And uh, perhaps my fourth and final point is a request to you to have a collaboration uh, with my office, uh, the Consulate General of Bangladesh in Toronto. I represent the government of Bangladesh. I head the office, as she mentioned. I think we can work together. I'm here to help you, and community is the lifeline on my office. Um, I have no meaning unless you come and collaborate with us. So it's a request to all of you to come, to uh, allow me to help you, to allow me to take help from you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If it, uh, if you still come, uh, join us, there's a little uh, small token of appreciation from uh, the chapter. Thank you very much for the words of inspiration and thank you for making the time. I know how busy your schedule is and you were texting me when you're on your way. He's uh, got many, many commitments during the day and a lot of uh, dignitaries are visiting from Bangladesh. So we really appreciate it. And it, it will be a, a great source of encouragement for all the chapter members in Canada. Because as you know, all these Bangladeshi architects, they are members of uh, Institute of Architects uh, in Bangladesh. And now they are starting their journey or uh, they've already started their journey in Canada. So we need all the assistance uh, from the Consul General and that's why this is so meaningful uh, that you could join us today. So thank you very much. As I was uh, mentioning before, there's uh, been several uh, Bangladeshi architects who had won Aga Khan Awards in the past. We tried to put a small uh, compilation of those works together. So uh, Dr. Ulrike, I hope uh, you will appreciate it as well as all our attendees here, just uh, if you give us a few minutes uh, to get it going. Thank you. been done by architects of the past. What was has always been. What is has always been and what will be has always been. Such is the nature of beginning. During Bangladesh's war for independence from Pakistan in 1971, the enemy pilots didn't bother bombing it because they thought it was an ancient ruin. The complex was finally finished in 1983, nine years after Lou died in Penn Station.
You never saw it finished, Bob. He didn't. No. You never saw this. Digging pictures? Yeah, we've been here now for about five days, and uh, it's... Five days? Yeah. It's a lot of pictures then. <laughs> but uh, do you think you can really capture the quality of this building in terms of space, light, the volumes, and the layering of spaces, those ambiguities? Well, I don't know. Mr. Wise. When you think about this film, I probably have, at the most, ten minutes. Oh God, this is, this is, don't tell me that. It's 10 minutes for this building? Probably. I think, I think, uh, so, I think it's the whole thing is uh, very, very useless. Because you cannot treat this building like this. It was almost impossible, a building for a country like ours. In 30, 50 years back, it was nothing, only paddy fields. And since we invited him here, he felt that he has got a responsibility. He wanted to be a Moses here. He gave us democracy. He, he's not a political man, but in disguise, he has given us the institution for democracy, from where we can rise. And that way, it is so relevant. He didn't care for how much money this country has, or whether he will be able to ever, ever finish this building, but somehow he has been able to do it, build it here. And this is the largest project he has got in here, the poorest country in the world. village of Rudrapur in Bangladesh has a very special school building. Constructed using bamboo and mud, it's come to be known as the Handmade School. Funds for the building came from Dipshika, a Bangladeshi NGO engaged in integrated and sustainable rural development. And the design was by one of Dipshika's ex-volunteers, German architect Anna Herringer. Anna's connection with the community gave her clear priorities. We wanted to improve the existing building techniques because um, whenever you try to bring something from outside, then also the economic power, also the culture, the craftsmanship, all, all these things um, are somehow lost. To help with the project, Anna assembled a team of local and foreign experts, including sustainable construction specialist Eike Rosfag. The design is based on the local houses, so like the local houses design in, in mud and bamboo, and the construction, everything is quite near to the local tradition. As the village has only limited access to electricity, it was important to maximize the school's natural lighting and passive climate control. As well as providing big bright classrooms, the design incorporates imaginative learning and playing spaces. On the ground level, small caves are used for playing in, studying and relaxing. Throughout the building, light and shade are blended with colours, shapes and textures, creating ideal surroundings to stimulate and encourage learning. It's an environment that there's no doubt enriches the lives of the children it serves. for me are living beings. They breathe, they have a soul of their own, and uh, they age. The Beitar Aouf Mosque in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, is unlike any other. It's the work of architect Marina Tabassoum. I tried to get rid of the symbolic elements in a mosque is because I wanted to so that this is not only used as a space for prayer but also for other activities, uh, social communal activities that it can encourage that to happen. The fact that it doesn't look like a mosque uh, initially was a barrier, where's the dome, where's the minaret? 
And then, of course, I, we had to go through the process of telling them that, you know, you don't need a, a minaret or a dome to, to make it a mosque. This is the prayer hall. Uh, this is the main space of the whole mosque. Um, as you can see, this uh, space was perceived as a pavilion. Um, it is on eight columns on eight sides and then converges. So this is where you can see the entrance court. Um, you see the light and the breeze coming in through that, those walls. It's all naturally ventilated, perforated brickwork. And interestingly, this whole brickwork is load bearing. I think this is a unique architecture because in Bangladesh you hardly find environmental friendly mosque. You see the lights, the air circulations, uh, the layout of the mosque. I've always been very interested in uh, spirituality as an element in architecture. So you have to enter into a mosque, uh, leave behind your uh, daily worries and worries <laughs> and stresses. So it's a kind of a labyrinth that you enter through and as you walk along into the prayer hall, you leave behind all those things and you sort of try to concentrate. So the space is designed in a way that it, it does that. It's certainly unusual to find a woman architect both designing and constructing a mosque. First and foremost, I don't see myself as a woman in that sense when I'm doing my projects. I'm an architect and that whole persona as a female uh, somehow vanishes when I'm into my work. standing now when I first came and I saw only water and uh, I just told I don't see any land and where do I build and she said that well that's it this is what I have bought I observe the way people built with uh, bamboo here and at, uh, in some places I have used exactly the material they would be using in their traditional houses. I said that no I'm not going to innovate everything here. So my innovation is that how to have a uh, platform uh, that floats and that settles on the ground. It is a riverine country Bangladesh and it has got a lot of a people's house they get drowned during the monsoon period and they can come to a school like if they built a floating school it is a floating in summer and it is a, in the summer month it is not a floating anymore and it is on the dry land but we have to improvise uh, there are of course very sophisticated way of doing it but it required a lot of uh, engineering and a lot of money and I, I thought that why don't we do something very basic which can be a learning experience also So this particular place opens up the children's imagination to the experience of nature and learning from nature I think is very important when you grow up as a child. And I also saw that even uh, places not having much openings, uh, uh, not having much light inside. So I thought that if I could make something very light and innovation, the children can look into it and they can have something uh, going in their mind that, oh, this is interesting. The way things are being predicted, we are going to experience a, a big change in our landscape, uh, in our environment. Water is one of them. So we must devise 
uh, a strategy for that future. I'm not saying that we have a solution here, but what I'm saying that we have a thinking that is uh, been initiated. That yes, let's let's find out how we can develop a response to that condition. People can walk there and people can also go uh, to the river, take their bath and wash their clothes. This is very important for our city. We don't have this type of public spaces in our city, especially for all gender and all ages people. It, it brings all people together. Actually the inspiration of this uh, Riverside project came from the community people. They, they had the dreams and aspiration and, and since we are architects we could organize those dreams and aspiration then we could do a model or a visualization and we kept sharing with the uh, authority a, a project of uh, local government use of prokalper odhine kasta shuru kara jeneda porosobar madhyam diye ebong bhabishyote aro prokalpor madhyam diye eta kora sombhab এবং আমরা চেষ্টা করছি যে টোটাল মিউনিসিপালিটির এরিয়াটাই ইটস নট দ্য আর্কিটেক্টস হু আর ডিজাইনিং ইটস ইটস দ্য পিপল এন্ড देयर वर আর্কিটেক্টস এন্ড देयर वर आल्सो লোকাল गवर्नमेंट সো দ্য টিম ওয়াজ বিগার দ্যান ওয়ান এন্টিটি সো when we uh, sit with the people they found that yeah we can do it in a better way and that's the function materials are all locally available materials like brick then cement and nothing else very simple and uh, the crafts people are all from <laughs> from our city how the community ghat is being in used if you go in the afternoon you'd see the children are there they're playing there so it is beyond our imagination how it's been used here so i think people have appropriated this space even more than an hour, uh, what we planned for it every day i use this place as a morning walk and uh, feel very comfortable physically mentally and it's interesting for the people of jhenaida if we can extend this type of idea in many places of the city the you know our city would be beautiful from this pr project or process i have learned that like togetherness is powerful very powerful urban river spaces سيد الكريم منتو
2017 a big influx happened and almost 1 million people fled to Bangladesh overnight. So in the, this such rapid time, uh, this much uh, people needed housing and other facilities. There was a big need of professionals to help in this situation. can divide these projects in three phases. The first phase uh, was really the post-emergency. So what we tried to do is that we tried to develop and propose uh, new solutions in this tropical monsoon climate. And we got one opportunity uh, to do the first uh, women-friendly space in Camp 4 extension. Women can come here anytime they want just to chill and have a peaceful time. So here I will do. I will do. Money, honor, zeal, and all that. This was really different from the other buildings that were being built in the camps because it has very soft quality. A good quality space can really lift the spirit up for everyone. After doing this first project. A space for design professionals was established in this situation. We started getting uh, offers for more buildings like this. And then we entered the transitional period. This was the best time for us to uh, focus on the skills and the creativity and the wisdom of the people of the community uh, to reflect on the spaces and the designs. We decided to involve all the craftsmen and all who is there in the communities. We wanted to give voice to their skills and craft. This was one way of doing it. At this point, the whole camp was uh, moving from this transitional phase to the development phase. Um, at first, when we took the structural models to the community uh, and the craftspeople, who are basically the, the magician of bamboo constructions. Uh, we went to them and asked for their opinion. The whole camp, this mega camp, was developed with all the natural resources, mostly bamboo and tarpaulin uh, and all. So the idea was they, they grow these materials into their, in their backyards and they bring these materials and assemble it by themselves. We tried to create a dignified space uh, or a space that actually uh, represents their identity with the patterns, with the color, with the texture and with the touch of their hands in the, into the components of the building. Whenever we are not there anymore, uh, they can lead and they can develop uh, the life further anywhere they are here. They have the strength developed by themselves. Spaces in Rohingya Refugee Response. Farah Kabir. <laughs> Hussein Zilur Rahman. Hassan Khawja Fatmi <laughs> and Saad bin Mustafa That concludes uh, our event tonight. On behalf of the Canada Chapter Advisor Committee, 
Asan, and I would like to thank everyone for participating. Thank you for the volunteers. Our youngest mentee actually can be a mentor for the video graphics. She put all the video compilations together. So uh, thank you, Mohna. <laughs> Thank you to all the members, mentors, um, mentees, uh, our guest speakers, presenters. You want to add yeah. anybody? Sponsor? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all our sponsors uh, for your support. Uh, for uh, Thank you. Special thanks to Sadi Akhtar, Sabrina Rahman, Mohana Dash, and our volunteers who worked like, for the last couple of weeks restless. Uh, last night they worked here till 1 a.m. So that's a big hand for them, for the all volunteers. Uh, Muhammad Nazrul Islam, Mustak Sarwar, Rakibu Jaman, Anunno Bikash Burwa, Sharmin Sultana, Atika Tasmina Diti, Raisa Shaika Jaman. Thank you all. Thank you. I would also like to mention uh, one of our sponsors, Ride Alike, has joined us in person. So if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to uh, Mr. Zilani, who's standing at the back of the room. <laughs> we have a number of other uh, sponsors. Uh, our dinner, which is uh, served uh, fairly soon, uh, has been also partially sponsored by Chuck Bazaar. Uh, you had the uh, Momos, uh, which is very popular, <laughs> snacks, <laughs> uh, has also been sponsored, and uh, many others to name a few. And we had also the patronage of others uh, um, who are in person here and also are remotely joining us. So thank you so much. Uh, maybe I can uh, request Sadia to um, guide our um, guests of honor uh, to the dinner, and then slowly we can uh, follow their queue uh, in a organized manner, row by row. Maybe that would work. Thank you, Sadia.